Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in uh, one of the many ornate rooms in this beautiful building here. Um, my name is Jeremy Clark. I'm the co-chair of the Faculty of Science Advisory Board. And on behalf of my co-chair in the back there, Loretta, give everyone a wave, please. Um, and my colleagues who are around the room today, one of whom you'll hear from today, Dan Adamson, I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Science. Um, a show of hands, who, who knows what a faculty advisory board does? Anything, Doina knows, Joelle knows, that's good. You're exempted from this though. Um, excellent, Bob. <laughs> All of our board members know, that's good. Um, so when I, when I was at school many moons ago and before I joined this board also many moons ago, um, I had no clue there was even an advisory board at, uh, at a faculty or you know, what, it, what it did. And it turns out that uh, across the university, every faculty has a, has a board like ours. Um, different in format in some cases, but the main role that we play is to be the best friend of the dean and the best friend of the faculty. So that means it's a safe space for us to discuss ideas. Uh, the dean comes to us, the development team comes to us, we come to them. Um, super exciting things like the new VIC project, which I think is probably fairly public knowledge now, a huge investment of almost $900 million by the school and various levels of government to essentially reconstitute Royal Victoria Hospital um, into a good chunk of the Faculty of Science. So it's a very, very interesting project when you take a building that is, in some cases, 150 years old. Uh, many of the rooms have individual fireplaces, uh, trying to make that a more modern building, but it's gonna be just spectacular. And a big component of that is making sure that a, a, a good chunk of the, of the development is actually available for public use. I think this is a great example of a partnership between the school, the province, and the city of Montreal, which is ultimately what we're always, always trying to uh, bring those entities together. So little, that's a little bit about what we do. Um, we get to delve into all sorts of different things, which is, which is fun. Um, and one of those things is an event like today, where we're gonna learn about AI and education. Now, we have four, actually five, Dan, if we include you. Can we include you? Let's include you. Of the most, most foremost experts, I would say, on Earth in this topic today. So these are not people that do this in their spare time. These are actual experts, and they're also very accessible experts. So they speak in plain language. They use examples. They use analogies. They're fun. Um, so we're all going to learn in a very fun way today. And to kick things off, I want to introduce, I said we're, our role is to be the best friend of the Dean. Uh, dean Bruce Lennox I've known for many, many years. Uh, we worked together for close to 10 years. And Bruce is one of the best people I've ever seen at taking complex topics and making them, not simple, I would say making them accessible. So he's very, very good at taking disparate topics and telling it to somebody in a way they can understand and hopefully to action. And the more time I spend with Bruce, the more I appreciate that skill. I think the faculty, which comprises thousands of students, 260 professors, a number of support team members, they really, really benefit from the leadership of Bruce, um, who's a prominent professor of chemistry himself, but even more than that, is a great leader of our faculty. So with that, I'll bring up Dean Bruce Lennox. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, maybe we should just have another program with that introduction. Um, who wants to talk about organic chemistry? Uh, it's, uh, uh, I keep on trying. I keep on trying. Oh, it's great to, to be here today. Uh, it's really going to be a short introduction because this is, we have an incredibly important topic uh, to talk about. It's uh, it's the only thing that displaced COVID from our front pages. Around December, November the 4th or 5th last year, uh, when the chat GPT emerged into the public space, it's, it's been everywhere. And what we're going to sort through today, though no, the, nothing will ever be sorted, but sort through, is to understand what this is all about and what the implications are, especially for education, because that's why we're all here in the first place. That's what binds us as alumni, uh, as professors, as students, as staff members. Um, 
So I'm really looking forward to, to today. Um, just as a, before I get to that point, just as an overview as to where, where are we in the Faculty of Science. Um, you know, Jeremy gave you a bit of a, of a preview, but um, we're, we're in an incredibly good position. Uh, in this university, but within the whole constellations of faculties of science anywhere in the world. Uh, we have the ingredients that allow us to be in a great position. Um, something that none of us as professors, as academic leaders ever to take for granted for a minute, but we have the best students in the world. And you can't do what we're doing without having great students. But when you have the best students, a lot of stuff comes really, really straight, becomes straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I review, I'm, I'm out there, I'm out there in the Canadian, European scenes, and people are extremely envious, and I, ex I accept that envy, uh, of that what we have to work with is, is just talent. Mm -hmm. And I look at what we're doing in this university is, our major responsibility is to shape that talent. It's not to direct it, it's not to define it, it's not to remake it, it's to shape that talent because it's, it's coming from just the, the horsepower that our students have. That doesn't work unless we have the equivalent power among our faculty members. So we continue to recruit truly the best people in the world. And we can measure that because there's no one who applies and gets a position here who I don't have to deal with a thing called the counter offer. And the counter offers coming from great, great organizations. Uh, and it, it's a calibration, it's a validation. So with the support of our governments, federal and provincial, giving us the resources to do this, but the environment that our students have created for us, uh, lots of things become actually quite straightforward. Uh, they're not easy because there's things that happen, but uh, they become straightforward, and that's that's where this is this is kind of among the easiest jobs in the university uh, that I have because it's about facilitating that, not about deciding what somebody should do. It's about letting them do what they need to do, what they want to do, and making sure that they can be successful. So we're going to be hearing today from four of our faculty members and one of our alum, uh, uh, and. You'll, you're, you're just going to you're going to see four very different people talking about one of the most important problems that's emerged, again, in relatively recent past. Uh, let's just do a calibration too. So, you know, I was moderately precocious uh, as a kid. Uh, Isaac Asimov wrote a book in 1969 about this thing called artificial intelligence. It wasn't science fiction, it was science future. People always called what he wrote science fiction. It's completely mislabeled. And we've gone through at least three or four cycles, but our, my colleagues can document of how many times have, has it emerged, and then because lack of computing power, it's subsided and re-emerged. Uh, and we're now in a pretty interesting state that a lot is possible, uh, and that's what we're gonna hear about. So, who do we have today to uh, to talk to you, to engage uh, in a panel format. Uh, to start off, we have Dan Adamson. So Dan is uh, going to be acting as the moderator for this discussion. Uh, he's a graduate of McGill in chemistry, I'll just add. Dan and his later spouse, Carolyn, Carolyn Cummins, were the two most outstanding students in the graduating year. Uh, I guess they, they came to a compromise uh, uh, in terms of competition. They got married uh, uh, to, uh, to settle uh, who was, who was the, uh, the alpha. Uh, both exceptional students and everyone in the department of chemistry remembers them. And they graduated uh, 25 years ago. But he went on to Berkeley, got a master's, and then uh, moved into a completely different space uh, in, in structure where he became the um, got into industry, but into startups. He's the co-founder and CEO of Armilla AI, worked with corporations, standards bodies, regulators, insurance providers, um, to foster the responsible use of AI. Uh, he also co-founded Confia, using AI to support high-risk banking. 
and a firm called Outside IQ, which deploys AI-based due diligence solutions to over 100 financial institutions. So over the last 15 years, um, Dan has an incredible track record of, of, of statements within the industry in terms of developments and, and basically is creating flourishing uh, organizations. So he's going to be engaging with four of our professors today. Uh, the first is uh, Eric Kolacek. So Eric uh, joined us uh, about a year and a half ago from uh, Boston U. Uh, he brought a, uh, an incredible portfolio of accomplishment there, having uh, led a data science institute. Uh, this was just right on target for what we were trying to develop here at McGill. Uh, it was the, uh, the timing was perfect, Eric. And what he's accomplished in the last year, I like to tell others, and I've told him a couple times, this would take other people five years to accomplish, because he's an incredible convener of people and ideas, brought them together. He's in the Department of Math and Stats formally, but he's also the inaugural director of the new Computational and Data Systems Initiative. We also have with us Joel Pino. So P Professor Pino in School of Computer Science, um, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She's the VP of AI Research at Meta, uh, I guess formerly Facebook, or I don't know the status of the names, but uh, she's a vice, vice, while being professor here at McGill. Uh, she's the Canada CIFAR AI Chair, and she co-directs here at McGill the Reasoning and Learning Lab uh, with a, a very large team of graduate students. And her colleague, uh, who's also, they share uh, an academic lab, uh, the Reasoning and Learning Lab, Doina Prekup. Uh, Doina is also in the School of Computer Science. She's a CIFAR chair, uh, fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and she co-founded AI for Good Lab, uh, an initiative of diversity in AI. And Siva Reri, so Siva is in joint between the School of Computer Science and linguistics in the Faculty of Arts. He's a core member of MILA. This is this organization in Montreal um, oriented around AI research and application. He's a CIFAR chair. Um, and he works on natural language processing. And he's uh, very, um, uh, he's at the, the forefront of understanding of uh, the, the overall topic that will dominate much, much of our questioning today. Of, of uh, the, the platforms such as ChatGPT and, and Llama. So we've got an incredible team, uh, but that's what McGill is. Uh, we can go into many topics, many, many topics, and you say, let's have a discussion with, with four people on one of the most important topics in the world today. And you know, in 10 minutes, you can get the list. Uh, and I'm so delighted that today we have this team and this, uh, this uh, really accomplished moderator to take us through this really important problem. So maybe everyone would like to come up, uh, find your seat. Uh, everyone gets a microphone so you don't have to fight over those. Uh, and Dan, you can have the podium. Thank you. And just quickly before we begin, uh, I do want to recognize uh, that McGill is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill acknowledges and thanks uh, these diverse in indigenous peoples whose presence has enriched the territory on which peoples of the world now gather. Um, also, with my esteemed panelists, I think they all have different affiliations, but I do want to stress that uh, today their, their words, unless they say otherwise, are, are purely their own and, and reflect their own views and not those of, of their organizations. Uh, so with that, I'll just jump over. Um, so I think maybe just to set the groundwork and and I might say something controversial, but I hope not in my first sentence here. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we've all been taken aback, even myself as someone who has built 
you know, companies around AI when we, I actually had a marketing team tell me once we had to stop using the word AI in our marketing materials. Um, so we've come, we've, we've come a long way since the last year, as Bruce mentioned, um, I guess ChatGPT was released about a year ago. Um, and that year has seen a lot of, of change. There's been a lot of acceleration, a lot of, um, I guess, we'll call it po positive change, but also disruption, and, and that leads to um, p potentially many issues, um, a lot of thinking. I, I would like to maybe take the opportunity just to start more broadly asking, asking our panelists how we think the next, I would say decade, but that's too far out, I think, so maybe three to five years, how we think this will roll out more broadly to society and uh, and then specifically a little bit in education, but we'll dive further into that. And uh, I don't know who wants to start there. Maybe I'll start. Great. And uh, maybe Joel will, will take over from there. I don't know. Um, it's uh, the uncertainty is very big, to be honest. Right, the ChatGPT came a little bit out of left field. Maybe not totally out of left field for people who were in the field, but uh, it was a huge advance. I think we have seen sort of deployment to the big public, uh, but what my sense is that really where things are going to impact a lot more in the next few years is impact on the companies, right? And trying to find ways actually to take this technology, which is really surprising and amazing in a lot of ways, and actually doing something useful with it. And we're not there yet. The business cases maybe still need to be worked out. There's of course all kinds of privacy data issues that, you know, that mean that we can't really train the large models that we would like to train necessarily all the time. Um, there's, of course, uh, finding ways to make these systems more factual, more safe, better at reasoning. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of advancement on, on the research side there. But again, sort of deploying this in the, in the general population is going to be interesting. And then Probably from my point of view, an interesting impact will be on the creative side of, of industries where, uh, you know, there's a lot of amazement, for example, at, at image generation, uh, you know, you can create very beautiful things. Uh, maybe there the bar is a little bit lower than, you know, things don't have to be factual, they just have to look good. Um, and, and probably we will see a lot of impact there as well. But I feel like that we're in a really interesting, very unsettled uh, and very uncertain environment. What, there's uh, one of the reasons why I think this feels uh, disruptive and maybe different than than the last sort of um, revolutions, if you call maybe the internet the last one, right? It, it that happened over a period of years. This seems like it's very abrupt. That's one one piece. Uh, obviously, gains in efficiency are what all revolutions, industrial revolutions, have been based on. But uh, this seems a little different in that it it it's affecting white collar workers as well, right? It's affecting and and potentially not all the same. So if I'm in graphic design, I'm a little concerned right now, right? I, I To your point, something needs to be beautiful um, there. And, and I've seen stunning images generated by pick your favorite, stable diffusion or DALI, or, right? So um, how, I think it, it seems to me different this time, and I don't know if any of you want to comment and if you agree or or, or how, how do you feel about that? And I can jump in a little bit and, and let me pick a little bit on this point of like whether it seems different or not. Um, if, if we take some of the models that have been released, you've mentioned a few, ChatGPT, DALI and others, in many ways, we don't have a full account of all the ingredients that goes into building these models. I would say they're really they're artifacts more than sort of you know really research products. We don't have full detail papers and so on. But nonetheless, we can deduce a lot of the components. And by everything we can tell, all of the ingredients of the recipes were known. And so so that qualitative change it, it didn't come from like an aha research moment. It came because all the pieces were put together just so well. The quality of the data, the quantity of the data, the right algorithms, and the right amount of computation, such that you could get an object, a computational object, that suddenly reached a bar that just captured people's imagination, that made you go, wow. 
And, and that's a little bit hard to predict how do you, how do you cause that from, from all accounts, even the, the people at OpenAI who built some of these models didn't expect such a big moment. Um, and in a sense, that's also what's beautiful to, to join us point, like we haven't seen this roll out through society. We haven't seen what happens when that object meets all of humans, ingenuity, innovation, and creativity. And so that's gonna be what's really interesting to follow in coming years. Um, we, 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 we don't have the crystal ball to, with the ability to predict that. And, and even within the research, I think there's sort of two, two, maybe more, but two main opinions. You know, I think there's a group of people who think that if we continue to put together the same, relatively same ingredients, but increasingly better data, more data, more compute, we will continue to see step change. And there's people who believe we will need completely new ingredients and new methods, like an entirely new recipe to push us towards, for example, resolving problems of like, you know, reducing hallucination, solving factuality, having true reasoning and planning. Even being plugged in, we, we just don't know. I would say from the point of view of a crystal ball, what's particularly hard maybe compared to the internet era is the social factors. Right, so the level of disruption I think that we're talking about is coming much faster and potentially much harder than when we went through the internet era where there was this thing called the internet you may have heard of and then suddenly some of your friends maybe were doing a little bit of email and, and you know, it was sort of gradual. We're a system locally, globally, right, and we're injecting disruption into that system. Uh, how our regulatory environments react, how we react socially as cultures, how we react uh, across countries. Uh, there's, there's, I think we're going to see, contrary to the internet, where we already saw a manifestation of a number of these things, I think we're going to see, uh, if you think in terms of bathtub dynamics, sometimes people talk about, you get into the bathtub and you know it sloshes, but it sloshes back and whatnot. That's gonna be a much bigger set of effects uh, and it's gonna involve a lot larger collection of voices uh, that will need to be involved for us to, uh, to, to be able to, to surf those waves and, uh, and come through. Yeah. I'd like to add one point to this. So uh, I work in this area of natural language processing, which is uh, the main area kind of responsible for these technologies. And before, before Chat GPT, I think we were uh, maybe a community of 5,000 people, I would say, or, or maybe 10,000 people. And now, after Chat GPT, we are probably a community of 100,000 people. Like, all, many people are working in this area. And, and if you think of that, like, how can somebody who did not have that much training, how can they already contribute to research, right? And, and I, in some sense, uh, <coughs> It could also embrace embrace this technology. Right, the the bar that has been set is lower. Like it improves the accessibility of many things. Um, so you don't have to be that much educated to already access information. In that sense, uh, it's it's great. <coughs> yeah, um, and we're talking about uh, many diverse sectors of the of the economy. So. And, and the world population, especially for me, I'm excited that people who do not have any education, they can already use these things because they can interact in natural language. That's the biggest step, right? Um, but there are downsides, yeah. If you are not aware of uh, what the limitations are, there are definitely bigger downsides. You might believe that this is true, which in fact, it may not be. That could uh, lead to some uh, disasters as well. Yeah, the, the, some great points, and I think um, you're touching on this a bit when we say every sector will probably be Im impacted d differently and to different extents, um, and this might be a, a, a force for good, a democratization of, of uh, access to information, for example. Um, and there's, there's probably some risk too, but if we, if we shift gears and start talking about specifically the education sector, I think it's a good case in point where there might be some, some very positive impacts and then some things that we might be concerned about. Um, that we might have very personalized learning, for example. We might have, uh, I could envision my struggles with uh, 
second year calculus, going away with a personalized tutor. Um, a very personalized tutor who doesn't give up on me, unlike my professor not to be named. But uh, so, so, no, he, he didn't have that much time. Uh, you know, so, so I guess maybe I could get some, some of your, your reactions around specifically in the education sector, how, how do you think this will have some impact in the next few years? John, I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, so I think um, just as a little anecdote, actually, my very first research project back when I was an undergrad still in Romania was intelligent tutoring systems and trying to build some kind of AI to make an intelligent tutoring system actually intelligent, and I failed miserably, uh, but I still managed to get into grad school, so that, there was some good that came out of it. Um, but at the time, you know, this was mid-90s, and the technology was a, a lot worse in many respects, including, of course, the, the interface, right? The, we didn't have good natural language. It was very hard to communicate with these systems. It was all sort of forms, and anybody made any mistake, it was very brittle. So for a student who doesn't know what they're doing, if they have to go through that barrier in order just to interact with the system, of course, it's very hard. So I view the current natural language advances, image generation advances, as a huge step in terms of just making these systems accessible to the people that actually are looking for the education. And I think that's gonna just really accelerate our ability to provide more personalized education. Now, is it gonna replace teachers? Definitely not. What I think is it's going to help teachers actually deliver the material in a different way and I've actually seen, you know, and I have one child, so the third one is still in high school, and I've seen the teachers actually, you know, far from, let's say, banning chat GPT, actually trying to incorporate it in their lesson plans and rethinking what are the assignments. Now, that's hard work for a teacher. It involves an investment of time, but I think the students are quite engaged by it, and it brings a different level, it sort of moves the needle from sort of modes more rote work to maybe some more creative assignments, some things where it really engages the brain and you have to make connections. Um, so I'm optimistic that this is going to be good for education. Obviously there's going to be lots of downsides as well. Um, but education is one of the fields where it actually can make a positive impact. Um, so Dolphin would also like to add to Dan's point uh, that the tutor did not give up on that. <laughs> and it's the same for professors too, like uh, when you are a early career professor and you're trying out new material and you want to uh, get an assessment of uh, uh, how would the students react to this. Yes, what are the... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I was saying, uh, I mean, we, these, these models are also some, like students that, who don't give up on teachers. Um, because uh, we, when we design material, we can actually go and see where the loopholes are, like how, how should I structure certain uh, concepts. Um, and and uh, overall, like, it could also make my job more fun because there, uh, when you're teaching, there are so many other things that you should care, take care of, like course announcements, some logistics. Uh, so like these things now become so much easier because you ask these models to, can you compose this thing? And then uh, it would do it, and then we will send it right away. Um, yeah, and we can focus more on the creative side. Um, that's one. And, and when it comes to like uh, the impact, is it, uh, is it going to replace me or replace students? Uh, so it's, it's not. Uh, when calculator came, for example, we did not, uh, we still learn about how to do addition uh, multiplication. So, but, but now we work at a much more creative level. Once we figure that out, like we no longer try to compute them by hand. And this is the same thing that's going to happen with these models, I believe, that we will start working on much more creative things rather than raw things. Yeah. Let me add, just picking up on, on the point you put, 
out there, you know, I, I really think a, a useful way to think about these models is that it raises the abstraction at which we, we interact with the material. And, and there used to be a time when, you know, a sign of good writing was a beautiful penmanship. And, and then we moved on to, you know, having good grammatical, you know, construction of, of text. And then we moved on to, you know, having ideas and so on. And now we have tools that can generate essays quite easily um, with just a few prompts. Um, but with a few more prompts and careful reprompting, we get a much better essay. And, and so we need to be thoughtful about how we raise the level of, of abstraction and how, how we in integrate these, these tools, whether it's calculators and, and computers initially, and now some of these more advanced tools. Um, over the last six months or so, I've had a chance to go speak with several groups in primary schools, high schools, CEGEPs, and, and universities about these tools. And, and most often the questions that come from educators are about the challenges on evaluation. And, and, and I do think it raises profound question of how much of our teaching has been focused on evaluation, not necessarily at the university level, but how much of our, you know, the, the time of our teachers is dedicated to just this topic of evaluation. And in doing so, we may have lost a, a lot of the really important aspects of what education is meant to be, which is, you know, a guiding through knowledge and, you know, teaching how to learn itself. Yeah, I want to just pick up on that last point. That's fantastic. I think that change like we're facing forces uh, potentially uncomfortable moments uh, of looking in the mirror. And I think that at its best, looking in the mirror is a very positive thing, right? So asking ourselves, what are we doing as educators? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? What tools are we using? And are those because those were the best that we could come up with when we had them at a certain point in time? Or are they because they're fundamentally part of what we think is important as uh, education for this point in time? Uh, I think it also means that not only is it discussions that will need to be had uh, for among organizations within schools and whatnot, but there'll be a back end to this as well. Uh, back end that, uh, just to throw another alum into the mix, uh, my older daughter was a uh, computer science statistics double major here. Uh, part of what she's done is she's worked for publishing houses, uh, looking at the data on the back end of some of these uh, AI-powered uh, uh, education systems, right? So to simply put them into play and say, well, I hope they run well for you, uh, which people aren't doing, of course, right? That's irresponsible. Um, but to, to have people on the back end generating large amounts of data, analyzing that, and then in turn uh, circling back with the educators, Right, and trying to understand what's been the impact of the interventions and the choices that we're making and how can we improve those. So I think there's really just a whole ecosystem uh, that's going to evolve in this space. And I think there's just a whole set of processes that uh, in the best sense, I hope, are going to be evaluated again, re-looked at, uh, and, and hopefully we'll move towards a, a new next stage of how, how we view education. Yeah, on, along those lines, I think um, I was at a Neuro AI conference actually last week, and one of the speakers showed a really interesting sort of research analysis of papers published in the last 25 years at the intersection of these two fields. And, you know, it was analysis of like 30,000 papers, right? So, a mind boggling number if you were to have to do this as a researcher, this would, you know, take your lifetime basically to go through this. But you can, you know, use one of these systems and prompt it, and it will select papers, and then you can prompt it some more, and it will select a subset of your papers, and then you can really focus on the, you know, 200 most interesting papers. So I think, from the point of view also of students, our students who do research, these are really interesting tools, and in some sense, it's a conveyor of information. It's a different way of organizing the world's knowledge and accessing the world's knowledge, and. Yes, it's different, you know, in the same way that using information retrieval systems was different from using cards in libraries. And it's fast, and it lets us sort of interact with the information in a different way. And now we have to figure out, you know, how to make use of it, basically. But in some ways, it's really empowering. Yeah, so I'm glad everyone's an optimist here. <laughs> uh, I'll play a role of, of pessimist, maybe, for a second. 
Um, my, I, I know of a 16-year-old. I have a 16-year-old son, but I'm going to try to keep him anonymous here for this statement. I know of, I know of a 16-year-old who had an English assignment um, on Romeo and Juliet, um, exploring the theme of fate. And this 16-year-old, uh, anonymous 16-year-old, uh, cares mostly about playing hockey and wants to get his projects done quickly and efficiently and used a certain tool, also I'll keep anonymous, but it produced very compelling, um, I guess, themes and actual text, very well spoken, uh, and did a great job for him. And then there was a certain whistleblower parent who stopped um. the process, but um. I, I have concern about, it. first of all, to your points, I think it, it things do have to change. Otherwise, we are, if we focus on evaluation, if we focus on projects doing them the old way. So, so my question are first, how, how will we start to instill that change in educators? And how uh, will this be like the, going the way of the dodo where old educators just die out? Or is this, uh, do we, is there some way to instill change? Uh, that's my first part of the question. The second is, h how are we going to deal with these different personalities and different goals? If the, if the goal is to teach how to critically think, how to learn, how to learn, someone, some anonymous 16-year-old, might not get that out anymore. I'm tempted to say that, you know, honestly, the critical thinking skill is, is the one I'm least worried about losing in this context, because to some degree, you know, it's very easy for these tools to produce things that seem correct and very reasonable and yet are not. And so this ability to look at material very critically and to decide, is this true, is this not true, is this supported, where are the sources, what other prompting do I need to make sure to have a high enough confidence, is the kind of skill that we, we all will need to develop to interact with these tools. Because the, yes, they raise the level of abstraction, but at the end of the day, you know, you're still responsible for the work that you, that you hand in. And, and so I'm, I'm not worried about us not having ample opportunity to, to practice those skills, and I would certainly encourage teachers to lean into those types of skills. You know, I, I, you know there's, there's a lot to be said about the teacher going ahead and producing an essay and then asking the students to critique and decompose that essay rather than, than just asking them to produce it from, from the beginning. Um, one thing when, I, when I've gone and, and met with teachers in, in various settings um, that I've encouraged them to do is to develop communities of practice. Because in a sense, you know, they're operating already in a framework that expects them to, you know, parents are expecting report cards that look a certain way and all of the system is set up for a pre-generative AI era. And, and so I'm encouraging them to find groups of like-minded individuals who want to experiment and innovate with it, bringing these tools into their classrooms because each of them can only try a few things. But you get 10 or 20 people together meeting weekly to report back on the experiments that each of them is running, you learn much faster. And so I think that's something that um, groups of, of educators should start implementing today to, to explore, to innovate, and to learn from each other in terms of how to br bring that into their classrooms. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I have a nephew and uh, I asked my nephew, oh, Maybe you should start a blog. Just just write a, start writing blog. Uh, write out your thoughts, so that uh, you. I, I would like to see your critical thinking. So it was for me, in some sense, to guide him through through this entire. Like he he's doing uh, his bachelor's in India, um, and and he wrote this beautiful essay, like really beautiful on on artificial intelligence and, and uh, wow this. Yeah, he he's, he's, he's still in his first year, and I would not expect him to write that kind of essay. And I was, uh, okay, let me check if this is real. And then I went to tools like GPT-0, which can tell you whether something is copied or not. Like when something is uh, generated by a language model. It's, and it, it gave a score of 97%. Like, 
<laughs> this is from the language model. Um, and then I told him, hey, uh, this is not acceptable, like you, what you have done here. I want to see your critical thinking, not what model produced. And then what he said, what he says is, uh, I mean, the model is already doing a good job. Why should I even try to? <laughs> right? And 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 I, I feel this is this is the thing that many students are probably facing, right? When you have these models uh, on the surface, they look really good, and then you might question yourself: Do you have to spend hundred thousand dollars on my bachelor's education when this model is already very good, and it does not take even time to produce that? Whereas I have to study for many years to get to that kind of level. I mean, that's that's my worry, and and to that, what I would say is like this technology is not going to die. Like it's it's going to evolve more and more, which could replace some jobs, right? And and we have to integrate this technology into our education so that students know what is going to come and focus on the parts that where they can contribute better and not be replaced by something else. I think that's the reason why to why they should still pursue education. I want to pick up on two themes that are first commenting on contribution and attribution, and then finish with a, a comment on, on maybe what I call sort of collective work, right? So from the contribution or attribution point of view, you know, we've already seen uh, a good deal of things in the news about, you know, if, 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 if all the poems that were ever written are now being used to have tools that are generating poetry, uh, and one of those poems was yours, then should you be attributed? Uh, what was your contribution, right? And I think that ties back to you know, how we answer that question as a society is going to impact how we can look our, uh, our students in the eyes, our children in the eyes, and tell them what's the important of things that we're asking of them when it comes to being evaluated or even just doing work in a classroom. Um, one possible answer for that is that we may be moving and I think we already are actually somewhat more towards an era where collective work, collective contributions to work uh, is valued much more than it used to be. So I was a pure math major. I was one of those geeks that, uh, you know, 30 something years ago was in a library late at night, pencil and paper, working out formulas, staring at the ceiling, you know, and things like that. And we didn't really work together. Right? We might sort of meet when we took break or something, we might sort of chat a little bit, but it was sort of understood partially from a, a point of view of what we thought the professors expected and also a little bit from an ego point of view. Right? If you didn't get the theory proved, that was a little too bad, but I just figured it out. Uh, yeah. um, but we didn't really share much. Right? And now, uh, for example, in my teaching, I have for several years now, and we've just created a course here at McGill where it's a practicum course. It is all about team-based work. Uh, we have teams of 10 working in parallel on large external partner projects. We have groups of four working on a variety of consulting projects within the university. And one of the things that it forced as we started making that change was how do you assess that? And it turns out educators, uh, educational specialists have been thinking about that for a while. I don't think we've perfected it. But it does start moving you towards things like peer, self, and instructor evaluations being combined, it does start moving you towards things like saying, is it okay in a class to orient a team towards success? Because it's not just about the students, it's actually about the partners who are bringing real projects that are going to make these ideal students coming out for employment, coming out as making an impact or whatnot. So in other words, again, forcing us to look at what's really important in terms of our metrics, our outcomes, and how do we get there. No, that's a great point, and I'll I'll put uh, ChatGPT on my team. Good. So, um, so you know, I think a lot of positives that we're talking about here about having a tutor that doesn't give up on you, um, having personalized coaching, being able to iterate and use it as a tool. Um, th there's also a risk, I think. To me, at least, it seems like a risk, like a bit with the internet, where there were haves and, and have-nots. I mean, uh, today, um, much of the world has access to the internet, but it took many, many years. Um, 
Is there a risk here of having populations enabled with this technology, education systems enabled, even within Canada, for example, with different levels of boards having different levels of technologies, um, different levels of internet access, even within Canada? Um, is there a risk that, that this will be less of an equalizer? And, and how do we start to combat that or think about that? And I guess this goes a bit to how, how do we think this will roll out, right? Do you know if you want to? So I think that, you know, with any technology, there's, there's the risk of creating disparities rather than, than making things more equal. But I think in some ways, the risks have lessened over time, especially with this kind of technology that runs on the internet. As long as there's no paywall, right, it's accessible. You don't need to have a fancy machine. You can run things on your phone, right? Most people have a, a cell phone now. Um, so as long as things remain in the public domain and accessible, as long as there's no paywalls, as long as we can have open source systems as well that are accessible for people to sort of take and fine tune and, and adapt to their needs, I think that this is actually helpful. Um, and it does allow people from all over the world access to a certain level of knowledge and of education that might have actually been hard to obtain otherwise. So, you know, like I said, my, my origins are in Romania. I do sometimes talk to, to educators there. Um, you know, when I was growing up, we were behind the, the curtain, right? So we had, you know, a very small number of Western books that were really, really prized. Access to information was really vital. Now, of course, that is, that is gone. But also the fact that now students have access to these tools that they can take open source code and adapt it to their needs, that they can make something there and they can put it in a startup is really empowering. And so, and you know, the, obviously Romania is not part of the European Union, so in some sense there's no more big barrier, but still it's relatively poor compared to the rest of Europe. Um, and my sense is that it really depends on how we as you know, as a society choose to deploy these systems, to regulate these systems, and also at the end of the day, honestly, to take whatever is coming out of these systems and actually redistribute it in a, in a fair way in society. And I think that's a really big question, and you know, I'm not a politician, and so I don't have the answer to that. Let, let me add, you know, I think Donna has a great point that in a sense, like software travels much more easily than hardware. We, we have very much a lot of the infrastructure to distribute these ideas. Where, where I worry a lot more is in, in what goes into building this system and who builds these systems. And, and let me take just the example of language models. The majority of them are built with English as the primary language. The great majority of the data that goes into training these models is in English. Um, some of them are able to generate text in other languages, but it's almost all by happenstance rather than by intention. Um, you know, it's it's a bit like uh, you know when you go fishing and you put in a wide net and you catch everything. You know, they go fishing on for for material on the internet. They cast a wide net and they get everything in. Um, they are developed by people who mostly come from English language speaking countries, or at least may not come from those countries, but live in those countries and in those, in those societies today. Um, we, I have a team who built a lot of machine translation software. So you have, you know, you put in text in one language, it translates in another. For many years, all the best translation system always needed to have English as an intermediate. So if I wanted to go from French to Spanish, I had to go from French to English and English to Spanish. What that does in terms of sort of normalizing the language experience, the thought, the culture, the concept, it's, it grounds it in, in the English culture, which is wonderful in many, many ways. This isn't a criticism of necessarily uh, that culture, but, but it's, a, it's a recognition of the, the cultural colonialism that goes into building these systems. Um, now, we've built systems now that can translate across 200 languages that do it by language families rather than going through English. So, you know, it's a step in the right direction. But there are many languages that we don't cover. There are languages that don't have a written script. There are languages that are not present in the internet. 
And those languages don't get built into those systems and people from those communities don't, can't use those tools in those languages. I, I will add that some communities have taken a very strong stance on this. For example, the, the Maoris in New Zealand have decided to really take ownership of their, um, of their data and, and uh, sort of associate together and band together to decide how the data will be used towards building these systems. Um, in some cases, we've tried to build bridges to some of the indigenous communities in Canada who've refused to participate in projects, which we, we will always respect, of course, um, for them to have the autonomy. But, but it's a difficult choice even for them to, to know, you know, should we participate and, and bring our language and culture in this? If not, it won't be represented. But, but once we do, we lose a lot of, of, of the, the agency over, over our language, our culture. And I speak only of language, but this goes to, to so much more context and, and the representation of people and culture that goes into this is, is, is not diverse at all. And, and that's, what, that's a bigger concern for me than, than how the technology is distributed. I want to actually pick back up a little bit on the technology side, but with the cultural angle. Uh, I think we tend to, coming from the society most of us do, being in this room, we tend to overestimate the ease by which uh, many cultures across the world can deploy infrastructure, find the energy to run it, have social systems that will support even facilitating uh, that to be set up. Uh, I know in my previous institution I was uh, part of groups that were working with uh, teams in Africa to try and figure out the energy needs, and we're largely going towards small, highly localized solar solutions to try and get the type of cell phone access that was mentioned before. Uh, at the same time, I was at an event, I think in the fall, to announce a, a new AI professorship uh, at McGill, on the, uh, the, uh, the ag campus here. Uh, and the interesting duality that was being talked about there was that in Canada, right, in Western Canada, to be able to bring AI to bear on large, large farms, uh, bandwidth is a huge deal. Uh, that, so what we think we've solved in terms of internet, it still is considered, it was considered for the project that was uh, being described at that launch event, that was going to, in this country here, be one of the major impediments. Um, so I do think that we have solved how to address these things if a variety of culture aspects are in place. I don't think we've solved how to transfer those to uh, cultures in all their various varieties uh, with all the various challenges that many face around the world. I would like to add to that one. Um, is I have exact in a, a paper on how well these models work across different cultures which was well recognized by the community. Um, and and so, so given a, let's say I wear Indian dress and uh, ask uh, uh, what am I wearing? And then it would just say dress. Um, but, but that's not what I want. Like I want like I'm wearing kurta or I'm wearing, like this is specific to my culture. And, and, and the wedding pictures, wedding pictures, if you look at different cultures, like they, they look very different. And, and we want those details, and uh, these models are somewhat normalizing across different cultures, which means we might lose some of that. Um, and there's also one additional worry that uh, is uh, there might, there's also tendency to amplify the biases that were already present in the society. Um, and we might propagate them through these models. There's active work on addressing this thing. But yeah, that is a problem. These, these are some of the risks of uh, these models at this point. Yeah, I, I think these are all great points. And uh, I've been following and we've been testing models many, across many generations. And, and the, the early models that were trained early on, they would always, they'd always go down this spiral. It would always end if I asked it to go further enough down the story with somebody killing somebody or something bad happening. It was that bad, and 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 then they started to introduce RLHF, right? So, so some human feedback into the loop to prevent some of this from happening. And the interesting thing about that, though, is it's somebody making a judgment call. And it seems like both the text that has been used, I'll say this because I'm a white male, but seems to have been mostly generated by white males, that it's used for training, and then the ideals or the cultural 
installation of what's right or wrong and that feedback came from, I'll call it Western white male cultural ideas, right? And so, um, you know, I don't know, I think it's a very difficult question to say, how do, how do we refine this to cultures? And we have some giants, not directly represented in this room, but um, who are trying to judge and create a, a global version with ChatGPT, for example, of what's right or wrong or where the boundaries are. And that's very hard to do at a, at a global level. So something that we do, I think, all have to be conscious of. The, the, I, I think the other piece around resources, though, is that, that if we can then start to localize or have power to generate some of these large language models, for example, the, the reality is there's a huge amount of computational resources to do that today, and only a few bodies actually can do that at a world-class level. Um, okay, some, many of them are represented here with either Google or Meta, or even ServiceNow, I think, has done some yeah. work there. So, uh, but but uh, how, how do we start to enable academic researchers Right, to, to have access to these resources, to start to be able to identify and use their own versions of these tools, have best practices, because actually it's gotten very, very complex to be cutting edge in developing these. And I, you know, so, so how do we start to then enable academic research for good? And I'm not just talking about academic research into LLMs, that's great and cutting edge, but how do we access those tool, enable access to those tools to somebody in pharmacology who's designing a drug study or and a large, has to go through a large amount of data, right? And um, given that this is so computationally intense and so difficult to get right. So maybe I can start on that because that's a really, um interesting question that I think has some good answers, perhaps. So training a very large, you know, chat GPT sized language model is very intense in terms of computation and data. However, once you have a model, fine tuning small layers on top of it is actually cheap, cheap in terms of computation and cheap in terms of data. And so, so long as there is access to the core and one can build on top of that, you don't need to have access to the code of the core even, you just need to be able to run it. And with that, one can go a long way. And actually, I've seen a lot of our students, in fact, taking Llama, taking some of these models, very large models, and doing some quite interesting things with them um, by just using small amounts of, of uh, carefully selected data and you know, using Compute Canada, which is a wonderful national resource. Um, and, and sort of pulling together resources within the lab. Um, I think going into other disciplines is a much tougher issue and requires research and probably innovation in terms of the methodology. So let's say what we want is not a language model or a image generation model, but a molecule generation system. Well, for that, we need, in my opinion, different tech than what we have now. Yes, some of the similar ideas but we don't have as much data. We are never going to have as much data. So we need models that can be trained on small amounts of data. And we need to somehow leverage know-how that is multidisciplinary, right? You really need an integrated team that has chemists, that has biologists maybe, right? That has computer scientists, that, that has all these people working together. And without that, you don't get anywhere, right? It's not like with language, you know, language is out there. We have reams and reams and reams of it. Right. If you're getting into specifically, let's say, drug design or material design, it becomes much more precise. It's very exciting because we have some interesting recipes that have already been developed in, in the field, uh, but it's not something that you can just take off the shelf. And I think it is still accessible in the academic world, certainly you know, within the, you know, maybe not everywhere in the academic world, but certainly at McGill and, and at, at top universities uh, it is. Can I maybe jump on that, on that? I think the other thing you really need, though, uh, we, we've been working at this type of exercise over many decades now, but it's just cresting. And I think with, with, with uh, AI, we're, we're seeing an incredible need, is, is we need facilitation. 
within research and across in particular research communities. It's not just enough to expect that people will come together, uh, that they'll try and learn to speak a little of each other's language. This takes time. It takes even just bringing it to people's attention. And cross-disciplinary research is hard. Uh, we're not trained for it typically, although our labs now are, are doing much better jobs at doing it. So, for example, uh, here at McGill, the Computational and Data Systems Initiative that, uh, that Bruce mentions uh, that I direct, that is its mission, right? Its mission really is to connect and complement. It is not, unlike what's done at many places, it's not meant to carve out its own area and say, well, this one is mine, right? So it has a very particular role uh, that personally I'm quite passionate about. In the AI space, we are going to be launching, uh, so I'm announcing it here, we are going to be launching a new entity called McKay's. McKay's will be the McGill Collaborative on AI and Society. Right? It's a collaborative because, as Duane was saying, we have tremendous strengths across the university here in all the various aspects we've been talking about AI, right? We have, obviously, the people in uh, core AI research. We have the people in chemistry, even orga in organic chemistry, right? <laughs> uh, but we have the ethicists. We have people who are already deeply embedded in regulatory discussions in Canada, for example, and many more. What we don't have is infrastructure to coordinate all that energy, bring it together, amplify it. Uh, and that's what the McGill Collaborator for AI and Society will be doing. It sounds very exciting. And I think um, I know from talking to different researchers inside and outside of you know, c computer science, it's one thing to be focused on doing this. It's another to try to catch up and do a clinical trial with best practices and be able to pull in the latest and be able to access. These are real barriers, I think, to somebody outside. And, and to try to provide tools to get to that level of excellence is going to be something, I think, that, that will be quite the enabler, both for the researchers, but also their students, right? To get to, get to be able to see those best practices firsthand as they're conducting their research. So that's a very exciting initiative. Um, I think we have time for, we were allowed to go a little long before getting kicked out. Uh, and of course, anyone's welcome to leave, but we, we did go a little long, but these are important topics. Uh, we do have time for some questions, that means, and uh, um, if not, I can make some up. Nope. Okay. Bob, go for it. A uh, very simple question. Where do you draw the line between machine learning and AI? Or should I assume it's all machine learning and there's no such thing as true AI? So the way that I was brought up, AI is the big thing and machine learning is a subfield of AI, although I think what's happened in the last, I don't know, five to 10 years is that machine learning has grown really, really big and has also crossed some boundaries on disciplines such as stats, for example, statistics and uh, sort of other parts of computer science, data management and so on. Um, and so, you know, I think of them now as overlapping bubbles, but AI has a lot of other things in it that are not machine learning. For example, search algorithms, planning algorithms, um, a lot of sort of historically important stuff that's, that's not necessarily learning. Well, certainly a, search, certainly a search algorithm is also machine learning. It learns how to search if it gets feedback. If you incorporate the feedback, but you can also think of it just in terms of, you know, it's got a fixed strategy for searching something, no feedback, and that's sort of the, the old school way of doing it. At a very simple level, we saw a lot of progress, for example, on games. If you think of like solving chess, one way to do it without machine learning would be to just like enumerate all the different games and look through the space of, you know, hundreds of millions of games to find like the best strategy. Now you can incorporate machine learning in that as an example that looks at a board position and tells you for each move what's the probability of winning the game for that move. So machine learning t can tell you information that then can direct your search so you don't have to search through millions. And that, that is not just hypothetical. We talked a little bit about scientific discovery and, and I think the use of AI to accelerate scientific discovery is gonna be absolutely transformational to many, many fields. 
And the way that usually works is usually, you know, let's say you want to come up with a new material which has new properties or a new molecule. You can either search through the space of millions of different molecules or materials, or you can use machine learning to say, here's one molecule, let me predict the properties of that molecule, and you train an AI system to do that. That lets you rank in order which are the best molecules for your purpose, whether it's medication or something else. And then instead of having to synthesize and try in the wet lab millions of possibilities, you can like take the top 10, go from the top and take the top 10 till you find one that works. And, and I've had colleagues tell me that using these kinds of approaches, they've cut down essentially in six months, they've made more progress than they would have in 25 years of scientific discovery. But that's still, in my mind, playing machine learning. That is incorporating machine learning within search. So you're cutting down on the search space by using machine learning to predict the value of certain designs. AI is the big, I mean, I'm, I'm, Doina and I grew up on the, you know, <laughs> the same textbooks, you know, AI is the broader picture of cognitive abilities and machine learning is specifically the ability to use data to make right. predictions. So where is the cognitive component coming? It does, I mean, planning, reasoning, memory, association, all these things, they can be accelerated by machine learning, but there's a piece of it that is not necessarily machine learning. Okay. Oh, my question was, but you mentioned critical thinking, and then there is accuracy. I spent 25 years as a journalist, and the amount of garbage and inaccuracy I see now, this whole technology revolution has proliferated that. Is there a way you see that this can be used, chat GPT and all of the other AI, to differentiate accurately? And then, is it a cultural question as to what's accurate and what's not? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and it's... Oh, so the question is, uh, you, you have uh, these systems that are generating all these articles, and how do you, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, how do you judge creativity, and as well as like, uh, how do you tell which is what, and according to what culture it's correct? Uh, yeah, and, and accuracy. And accuracy, yeah. The, That's right, yeah, it's so much. How do you break through that? Because there used to be, before all of this, at least some responsibility the individual has to take for having accurate, quote, information. And Absolutely. How can this accelerate that process or exacerbate it? Okay. Uh, to, to answer that, like, uh, uh, I work mainly on retrieval augmented language models. Like, uh, that's a separate, it's not chat GPT, but chat GPT that makes use of uh, evidence. So what it does is uh, it has a repository of knowledge, and then when when an article is fed to it, what it does is uh, it for each statement it goes and retrieves from the knowledge base whether uh, oh, these are the related statements. Based on these, can you tell me if this is true or false? So in that sense, uh, it can detect misinformation, but but then. Some of this misinformation is so hard even for humans. Even if you provide all this, it's... So those are the cases where these models fail, and they, they fail usually at uh, the contemporary issues. Like, they would, they would correctly detect uh, things that happened in the past. Like, if you try to produce misinformation on things that happened in the past, because it's already in the repository, it can uh, fact-check that kind of thing. Uh, whereas on contemporary issues, it, things take time to be in the repository. This, this is a big problem, yeah. So, you know, I think that the onus really has to be, you know, if you imagine somebody using one of these systems to produce an essay or an article or any kind of piece of information, the onus has to be on that person to actually check that whatever the system has produced is accurate. And, you know, we have similar issues, for example, with systems that can write programs. It's an ability that's emergent in, in these large models, but these programs are not necessarily correct. So, yes, the programmer skips the step of running the program, then they have to actually debug it and make sure that it's that's all correct, and I think that's not something that we can necessarily push aside. We can build better and better tools to support that activity, but at the end of the day, there has, at least in my view, there has to be a person that, that kind of validates. I also work for a company that invests a 
ton in terms of misinformation and automatic detection of, of misinformation, I would say, today on platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and others. Uh, you know, 95% of false content is detected by algorithms rather than by people. Um, but to, to Siva's point, a lot of time when it's a newly arising issue, it's very hard to determine, and, and in some cases, huge human judgment is necessary. Once you have that information in the system, then propagating that at scale and like taking down, for example, vaccine misinformation and so on is, is very quick to do. But the initial establishing of truth and the initial detection often requires human input or high quality data. I, I had a question. Um, and as a disclaimer, I would just like to say that I'm a very basic user and have very basic understanding of AI. I'm also a staff member uh, at McGill and um, I appreciate very much all of the discussion and the topics. Um, one that I caught on especially was attribution or uh, it could be alleged uh, copyright infringements or plagiarism um, and also the embedded uh, issue of, of discriminatory uh, elements in AI such as ChatGPT which is very easily verifiable but there may be other risks also where we are, aren't aware of. Um, and amongst the topics discussed uh, many of them about how to use the tools uh, that we have, the new emerging tools, but I wonder if there is also a concern maybe about ethical use of these tools, and um, my standpoint obviously as staff is people who uh, come out of institutions like our own and go onto the job market uh, will be using these tools, but um, I hope are uh, aware of all of the risks and issues that could come with them and also their evolution. So uh, that's my question, basically. I'll take a stab at, uh, at responding. I've been uh, struggling with my mic here. Um, so one of the things that uh, we already are talking about even prior to launching uh, this collaborative that I mentioned is certainly how to best try and approach uh, the instruction of ethics across campus. There are already several uh, discussions that are beginning we want to try and coordinate that. We also want to try and figure out what are the levels of exposure that we need. Ethics is one of those things that like in, in data science and whatnot, it used to be half a day you mentioned, oh, and ethics are important 20 years ago, right? And, and part of what happened during sort of what I would characterize as one of the large previous waves to the current AI wave was the data science wave uh, that started about 10 years ago where ethics and communication stopped being called soft skills. Uh, they're just skills period, right? And ethics is really critical as a component of it. We are working on uh, uh, data science program development here at BU, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at McGill and uh, throughout the faculties. And uh, one of the things that we'll be doing uh, is making sure that ethics is a part of that. Should ethics be something that is uh, taught as, as commonly as, say, everyone uh, right now takes uh, sexual misconduct training? for example, whether you're a student, whether you're a staff, faculty, uh, is that something that should be done here, right? Where do we have the expertise to teach on ethics, right? How can we make use of the various levels of expertise, right? So all those are things that really go very much to the point as just for this as a case study uh, for why this type of coordinated discussion is really, really critical. Thank you very much. Great. So, yeah, I think we've touched on some critical pieces, and I think uh, around accuracy, around use of the tools, ethics, bias, and education is clearly part of the answer. Uh, there, uh, we even something simple like uh, these are uh, these LLM tools are inherently built to just predict the next word. Right. That's the core of their function. If I go and put into ChatGPT, uh, the CEO was late because. It's a leading sentence, but 99 times or 100, it will respond with he, right? He was out sailing or he was stuck in traffic, right? And so if you give that to my, I'll keep it anonymous, somebody uh, who's related to me older, uh, he'd say, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you give that to my, okay, somebody younger in my family, uh, they'd say, you know what, that really should be a, a gender neutral pronoun there, right? And, and so, you know, because they were late out driving, right? So um, 
you know, these are really tricky, even at the core root of the, of the problem, and uh, something that's I know very active in in research now. Uh, so I think that's that's it. a few closing notes here. First of all, thanks to my esteemed panelists uh, for joining the conversation, and and thank you to everybody here coming as part of the McGill community and the McGill alumni. Um, I don't know, Bruce, if you want to finish this off, but I, I do want to highlight there's some great events coming up. Uh, there's, of course, the Leacock Lecture, but more, more importantly, um, tonight there is the Young Alumni Dance Party, uh, brought to you by McGill Young Alumni and the McGill Latino Alumni Society. And I will, I'm maybe not eligible, but I'll try to get in anyway. Uh, <laughs> So a lot of fun stuff, and please stay part of the, the community um, with all of the, you know, everything that's happening uh, around turmoil, obviously. Um, staying in touch with McGill Connect is a great tool if you're not already. And uh, of course, the McGill Giving Program bursaries and scholarships will be absolutely more critical in, in the times ahead. So thank you, everyone. And uh, final word from Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, all of our panelists, um, our colleagues, uh, but especially thank you for joining us here today. Uh, some of you are, are here from out of town. You're here for the homecoming weekend. Uh, I hope this really de did feel like welcome home, because uh, it's, it's, it is heartfelt. Um, and I think that um, all I kept on thinking throughout these discussions is that we have the power to make change here, to lead it, not just direct it, not just be behind it. We have the people, uh, and frankly, I think what you heard is why I'm able to express every day is I just love being here. Thank you. <laughs>